Um, hopefully, you're as excited as we are about social media in the classroom. My name is Bonnie Schutte, and I teach at Mount Vernon High School, and I am on my 28th year of teaching, and I am from the Ditto Master time period, you know, where you got to smell the stuff as it came off the machine. So, um, and then, my colleague Scott Patterson is my former student. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I had by, uh, Bonnie my senior year for AP Bio. This is my sixth year teaching. We both teach at Mount Vernon High School. We actually have a common prep room. So it's been, it's been really exciting. Bonnie is really a master at teaching craft, so it's been awesome to learn so much from her and sort of have a good mentoring system with our science department. So it's, I'm, I'm excited to be here with you guys. I'll push the button. Oh, Bonnie. Bonnie's going to push the button. First things first. Um, I know you see like those things a lot. I, I hate that thing. Turn your phones on. Your phones Turn your on. things on. If you've got toys, the they should be on <laughs> at, at all times. No. I, mean, I don't know if, if you guys saw me in any of the other sessions, but I'm sitting there with my little netbook and I'm tweeting all day and I've been like looking things up all day. I've been, it looks like I'm texting, but I've been doing other things with my phone. Like, yeah, get them on. I think we really need to push away from that idea that if someone is doing this in a meeting, that they're being rude and obnoxious and inattentive because it's really most often the case that that is false. Even in my class, you know, kids will be, they're in there and I see them, they're doing this, and I'll go over and be like, you know, hey, what, what are you doing? I won't be like, what are you doing, young man, with that phone I'm about to confiscate? Because nine times out of ten, they're actually engaging in something useful for my class while they're in my class, even if it involves using their little pocket friend. One of the ways old timers like me can think of it is that when I was teaching regular level kids, they were talking and I'd be like, okay, be quiet, focus. When I taught higher level thinking kids like AP Bio, they'd be talking and I'd be like, stop interrupting. I go back and they're talking about, they're arguing over the, the structure of the cell membrane. I'm like, what? You know, they're engaged in the content. Yeah. So that's, that's sort of where uh, we want to lead you through. If you guys want the files or anything, there's a PowerPoint and our handout in digital form. If you got the QR code scanner and you can hit that, hit that. Uh, if not, I'm going to tweet out the link for all the things anyway, and we'll, we're going to show you where all that's going in here in a couple of minutes. And so um, I guess where, where we're going with this is why, why are you guys here today? Why did you come to, you know, we're all SECO members because... It's cheaper to be here if you're a SECO member, even over, you know, not buying the membership. So why, why are you a member of SECO? Why are you here today? I actually want to know that's not rhetorical. If somebody, you know, start talking or I will call you out. I was going to say, I presented and then with a brand and then I was the presenter. Nice. But why'd you say? Oh, because I saw this on the schedule and I'm a big social media, like, I'm the person in my school who comes to for social oh, cool. media. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Learning more. Yeah, you want to speak the common language of your students. Well, and, and, and not just a session. Why are you at the SECO conference? I mean, obviously, you came in here because you're interested in social media. Why are you here in this building? I'm new. I'm lost. I need help. Nice. Oh. nice. No, no, that's, that's, that's perfect. So you came to take advantage of the community learning system that's here. And really, really, honestly and truly, creative learning can only happen inside of a community. And with the technology we have now, with social media, that's a system that kids already want to be inside of. It's a place they're going on their own time without us forcing it on them. We should be taking advantage of that community that they're already building and using it for inside school. Our next slide has lots of writing, but these are just studies and this is just information from other teachers. You know, uh, the, the girls you're going to see eventually for blogging, I, want, I just want to give you a heads up. I had both in class. You, you would never hear their voice any class period unless you went directly to them and talked to them. And you watch these girls. I have, who are those girls? I've never, they have their own channel and everything. It's amazing. So this allows kids that would never talk, to the shy ones, to have a voice in their comfort zone. Um, it's for collaboration. It's for worldwide collaboration. Um, this one is what struck me the most. You know, don't we strive for having those conversations like Socrates did in those ancient times? This is giving us the opportunity and a forum for that kind of thing. 
And the other thing that I really like about it is you can get on YouTube and every second on YouTube, there's more content being uploaded and added to YouTube and other parts of the internet. Every second, more than any of us could watch in a year. And we need to take advantage of that. Students shouldn't just be sitting and getting anymore. Students shouldn't just be making projects. They should be making content that they're prepared to share with the rest of the world because that's where society is going and that's where our global economy is going. So we've got a lot we want to share with you. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so one of the things, uh, I saw this from the, uh, the conference that I didn't end up going to. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because I didn't want to miss a whole week of school and then <laughs> got snow day out of a whole week of school anyway. But you know, th this is a place where I think we, we should be moving, not just for our students, but also professionally. I joined Twitter not even a year ago. Like I had an account that I tweeted something at Dropbox, so they gave me extra storage, and that was it. And really, since last March, when I really got into Twitter, I've grown more as an educator since last March than all of my five years prior. You know, I was like, I mean, I'm on fire right now about <laughs> learning about the teaching practice and the art of teaching in ways that I haven't been this excited about, like, curriculum and lesson plan design since, you know, back in undergrad when it's all brand new. So really, really, if, if, if you weren't on Twitter before and you weren't using it before, honestly, this will change your teaching practice. I can almost 100% promise that. And I, I'm a little older than he is, and I started using Twitter the most, uh, most here at this conference. And I, I'm going to tell you some of the things that I've learned from it. I'm not going to stop because it's really cool. <laughs> okay, that's you. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that we want to do today that I've done in my classroom is called the back channel. And some of you guys have probably even noticed, like, news anchors have, like, Twitter handles that they're putting, like, down below their names. And there'll be a hashtag for the news. You can actually pull up that hashtag stream and you can see what people are tweeting in response or about the news that's on TV live. And this is one of the most powerful ways that you can really engage shy students in your classroom. The kid that won't talk with his voice or her voice in front of their peers, more often than not will have no problem saying those things with the fingers. It also creates an opportunity for that kid, that impatient kid that just wants to blurt things out. It gives them a place to blurt things out where it's not an interruption and it's not a distraction. I don't have to stop my flow in the classroom to address behavior, to address comments, even if they're great comments. They have a place where those can all go. So basically, you know, right now you guys are participating in a back channel. Even, you know, you're nodding, you're, you know, you're interacting and the speaker can see that. So this idea is not really new. So there's, there's different places where we can use it. We're gonna use Twitter today. If your school is like, no, Twitter is the devil. First things first, you should get on that, honestly. We have browbeaten our administrators into Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube being unblocked at our district this year for the first time. And it was a tremendous fight, but I feel very good about it because I really think that it is super effective for learning. But some of the ones that are never blocked, today's meet, is a really popular one, uh, works very similarly, and uh, backchannelchat.com is actually an app. They have an iP iPad, iPhone app, but you can use it on anything that has the internet, so any device, any computer, and it's specifically designed towards education. We have these on your handout. Yeah. yeah, all these links are on your handout too, so if you're frantically writing, just, you know, they're, they're there. And what's, what I really like about Backchannel Chat, opposed to the other ones for In My Classroom, is I'm in the driver's seat. If a kid says something that I don't like, I can delete it right out of the chat. On top of that, it has a really nice embed feature. If they pick pictures off the internet, it'll automatically embed it from most image sites. If you pick a Wikipedia article, if they put the link, it'll like auto-embed the first paragraph. YouTube videos, it'll pop up a little like watch the video right now on the channel. And it also censors. Uh, almost over extremely censors, like a kid tried to say poop because we're talking about excretion and it, you know, four <laughs> asterisks appeared which made it look like what he said was probably worse. <laughs> but, so here's some examples. Uh, this is uh, a back channel that was going on at a workshop I just went to up in Michigan, the Michigan Flippers Flip Learning Conference. It was really cool. All through the day, uh, my flip 14 was a hashtag they're using and you could actually participate in multiple sessions simultaneously. You know, you're looking at the schedule like, oh, I really want to be in this session, but I'm in this session, and the other one seems cool, and what am I missing? Bonnie and I, actually yesterday, I was in two or three sessions all at one time. 
because I'm engaging in my session. Bonnie and I are talking about her session. We're sharing links. We're talking about ideas. And this is what you can really pull in for your whole class. Here's a screenshot uh, from back channel chat so you can see the kids can pick funny pictures. The default that day was apparently the red one. And you know they can put in their name. I always encourage them to use their name because I use this for participation points during class. Um, even before I've discovered the back channel, when kids are talking in class, I, I want it to be more of a conversation, less of a, I'm delivering the content because I am the master. So it's always been a component of my grading system, and this is another way that they can participate. And you see they're putting in links and uh, other stuff, and on the next slide, uh, there's actually a really cool thing. Uh, we were showing a video in class. This is kind of cool. It's a history channel. It's about the history of mining and mine careers for my geology class. But the kids were able to explore. They're able to interact with each other without rudely talking over the video. If they didn't want to do it, this, this young man had no interest in it, so he just wanted to zone out and watch the video and ignore his peers, which you know, I'll address that later with him. <laughs> But actually, at this point, they were looking up how much miners make and comparing it to different career options in the field of geology. I mean, this is like common core all day long, and it's a way that really allows them to explore their interests and take ownership of what they're learning in class. And for those of us who are a little old-timer here, this is not distracted. Remember, they're thinking in these webs. You know, this is, this is how they're learning and taking their own learning from the lesson that's going on. Right, so we're uh, we're going to try and run a back channel here today. Um, you want to go back? No, no, no. Stay here. It's good. Uh, pull up the hashtag Cinco14. If you don't know how to do that, or even if you think you know how to do that, there might be a better way than you know how to do that. On Twitter.com and Twitter's little app for smartphones is actually one of the worst ways to do that because it pulls it up, and every time there's a new tweet, it says, "There's a new tweet. Click this thing if you want to see it," and you'll be clicking all day. Plus, and if you want to send a tweet, it does all kinds of awkward, terrible things. Uh, one of the programs I use is called TweetDeck. I love it. It is easily, I think, the best way to take advantage of Twitter. Hootsuite is another one very similar, but it'll let you do more than Twitter. It'll let you do Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, a lot of social media platforms all in one hub. So you, if you go to tweetdeck.twitter.com or hootsuite.com, you can sign up. There'll be a little authorize this app thing for Twitter, just like, you know, when you play games on Facebook, you have to say, yes, Facebook, it's cool that I play this game inside Facebook. It's like that. And what these two really do that I like a lot is it gives you different columns. So I have a column just for Seco 14. I have a column just for when people mention me. And I have a column for my regular Twitter feed, all three of them right next to each other on the screen that I can see at any given time every time I look at my network. There's another one, if that is all like way too scary for you and there's just going to be too many things, which is understandable because it's a lot of things. There's all kinds of websites. Twugs is probably one of the easiest ones, twugs.com. You go there, you link it with your Twitter account, just like linking anything with any social media account, and you put in the hashtag and it'll make it look more like an old school chat. How professionals are using Twitter now is less about sharing links, less about saying, this is what I had for lunch today, hashtag I'm full, and more about creating an interactive chat room where ideas can be shared and growth can occur. So if you go, any one of these, pick one that you like better, pull up the uh, hashtag Seagull14. I like this one if you're more old school, have actually done a chat room once upon a time, when the, if you can remember before the internet even had pictures on it. And uh, it, it just makes it really nice and easy. Does uh, yeah. anybody, I guess, make sure you have that up because that's actually, I want you guys tweeting that. You know, So if the, anyone you want, whichever one you feel you're going to love. Yeah, I think it's a great one. The audience is going to show you a tweet there. You guys have a problem with me now. So this is what Scott and I have been saying all day long. I don't know. So if you're using the tweet deck, what you can do, what, uh, what Bonnie will show you, she's going to go all the way to her left. Oh, I got it. So if you go all the way to your left inside your tweet deck, if you go all the way to the left, there's a little panel over there on your left side. And the top one that looks like a pen stabbing a square, there it is. just composed a new tweet. And there's a little one that says, see the search right below? Why don't <laughs> So if you write a message in hashtag Seco14, it'll appear to those of us that are looking at hashtag Seco14. 
we've been marking it. I don't know if anybody in here doesn't know what that means. I don't know what I'm doing. It means if, if you put hashtag in something, then that tags it forever on the internet. So if somebody were thinking, oh, I wonder what happened 10 years ago at CECO 14, and they put that in there, it would go to every time somebody had done hashtag CECO 14, or just the word CECO. So it would come up. I just so, so when you look at that, okay. the little search, you actually want to be on a show on this. I thought I found it. I So, so one of the things I also like about uh, why you should use TweetDeck or Hootsuite over the others is I've actually made two Twitter accounts. I have one that's my personal Twitter, Spatterson's, that I use for professional development, interacting with other grown-ups. But I was fairly confident that if my students got a load of that, they would be very bored and or overwhelmed. So I actually made a second one at TweetMrP that I use just for my students. And we're going to show you some of that here in uh, the next couple of slides when you get down to Twitter. Yeah. All right, so before we get too much further, uh, vlogging, who's heard of blogging? Blogging, probably most, yeah, everybody probably. Vlogging, it sounds pretty much like you would imagine it would be. Instead of a blog with written words, it's a blog of a video. And a lot of kids are doing these now, the kids these days, and a lot of teaching professionals are doing these now. I, we have two students in common that actually use vlogging through YouTube and embrace the community of YouTube and actually approach them, ask them if they would make a video. What I really like about blogging, blogging, is it gives a really good opportunity for students to do those farther, deeper connections. You know, all that new core, all our NGSS has all this collaborative learning written in there, has all this like deeper level thinking, stuff that the kids need to really chew on and need to have whole discussions and there's not always enough time to do that in a 48 minute period. But like I said earlier, I'm highly confident that our kids should be creating content, they should be working on stuff like this. Instead of having them write a paper, turn it in, have them write a blog, have them submit that, not just to you, but to the whole internet. Can prescribe to all the same things that you've been doing already in your class, all the writing requirements that you want, but now they can add links, they can add pictures. If they do vlogging, they can do all the same things down in the links in the descriptions. They can add annotations for other videos. And it's a really fun way to get kids creating content that they want to be creating, that professionals are using right now in the fields for money and stuff, and get them familiar with that idea. Yeah. And if you're worried about, you know, wait a minute, they're not using pen and paper, they're writing. <laughs> and they're writing lots, and they don't even think about it. So these are going to be our two girls that are shy. I said, you know, you wouldn't hear their voice unless you went to them and said, hey, tell me, and watch them. <laughs> now, did you hear the words they used? World, global. Uh, you know, they're taught in, in finding sources because I'm interested and I want to learn this. I and mean, they're so engaged in this, and we need to harness this opportunity to get to them. And so one of the things that I do uh, pedagogically, and I could talk for, I could probably do two back-to-back 90-minute -back sessions on why I love flipping my classroom more than anything else ever, but uh, I'll limit it, but using social media in class, this is something I learned from uh, Gehanna Lincoln High School, they have their kids come in and they have them using social media, but it takes a lot more time, but you can actually interact with your students, you can go through the process of writing with them, you can go through how to analytically you know, look at data like a scientist. So it gives you a lot more time to work one-on-one -on -one with your students and use social media inside the classroom where you've got everybody together, where you can model what they should be doing. And that's really the biggest thing. You know, These kids that we have, when they go to college, admissions representatives are going to be looking at their Facebook pages. When they try to get a job, CEOs of companies will demand from them their Facebook, their Twitter, their Instagram passwords. 
We need to be teaching them how to use these things, not just more responsibly, but more professionally, if nothing else. Because I know a lot of my students, I've been talking them into having two different Twitter accounts, one for professional use, for, for tweeting with me, for asking for help. And I have at least 10 different kids that would rather tweet at me publicly than send me a private text message or email when they need help with their home, which is, for me, kind of mind-blowing. But it's, it's really, it shows that this is where our students want to be. And if we want to be relevant for them, we need to start using this more, and we need to start using this more. Yeah. And so here's, a, here's an example for me uh, with the flip classroom. Uh, the biggest shift is with the flipping, you know, you can talk video, not video, this and that. The biggest shift is it's more them, less me, when they're in the classroom. This gives me the time where I can still support the students who are used to a teacher telling them the things they need to know. Now they still have access to it, but it also gives me more time. I don't just give them, you know, you can't just give them the homework and then the schoolwork becomes the homework. It gives you an opportunity. I've got 48 minutes now with 20 to 30 kids at a time where we can get some really amazing stuff done and a lot of it in a social environment. And the YouTube really allows that. So here's, here they are in class. The other thing I love about flipping and using social media with it is it differentiates almost by itself. I and mean, I'm getting to the point I've got my two periods of classes are almost two weeks apart. And I've got students that are starting to pull ahead of others and students who need more time. And I'm able to give them more time because we have the technology to take advantage of it. Uh, we're experimenting with a BYOT initiative. So I've got two boys here. They're watching the next video. This little young lady is also watching it. These guys up here, they're working on one lab where they're modeling meiosis, and, or no, where they're modeling DNA synthesis. And back there, I've got another group that's back working on meiosis. So I can have kids in all different spots. And basically, it works like cloning. Like at any given time for a flipped lesson, there's three to 10 of me in my classroom at a time, which is really just, I, I just love, not, not only because of an egomaniac, but it also gives me a chance to really interact with all of my students individually and have time to do it. So d does everybody understand what he's telling you? He posts video online on his own YouTube channel. They watch it at home. They come into school with questions or they've got it and they maybe do a quick quiz so he knows they've got it. Then they work on something else and they move forward. And if they didn't watch the video last night, you know they don't do their homework. Or they didn't have internet access, then he has them watching it right now. And if they're uh, a kid that just didn't do it, now that they had to spend their time watching the video they should have done last night and all the other kids get to do the cool stuff, they don't like to do that so often. So, uh, they don't want to bring their own cell phones into class, that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. and yeah, their cell phones, tablets, and computers. Smartphones. Right, so um, we also let them, if they have laptops or tablets or anything they want to bring in, they can bring in. And we have um, a, a pile of Yeah, we have a, we have a cart with about 20 iPads and we have a no, 10 iPads, and we have a cart with 25 netbooks. But then we school. allow anybody, because yeah. we don't want them to think, you know, oh, he's the one who has to use the school I, iPad. It isn't. Maybe my iPhone, I don't want to have a really small thing I'm looking at. I'm going to go use the schools. You know, everybody has access to it. And, and the bigger thing, I mean, I've seen all kinds of different formats. I've, if you call up the hashtag flip class, hashtag flip class, all one word, there's a huge Monday night 8 p.m. chat that goes on. A huge, instead of a back channel, it's a chat room just about flipping. If you want to know more from there, there's some really amazing teachers there. And it doesn't even have to be involving homework. And there's a, the moderator of the chat has a completely homework-free English class that she's co-flipping. She's in California with a teacher from South Carolina for their English class. And they work together to make content and interact with their kids. But it gives you a chance because there's now two or three of me in the room, so I can model good note-taking while everyone is watching, oh, sorry. <laughs> while, while everyone is watching a lecture, I can model how they should be tweeting in a back channel while I'm also up there talking. And and how many of us, knowing that um, my teacher's working with somebody in South Carolina and we're online and we're doing something public, do you really think they're going to be jumping and doing selfies? I mean, it, it just really makes them behave and act professionally. Almost all of them. <laughs> Almost all of them. They are teenagers. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, totally. If you, if you, I mean, I totally get what you guys are saying, and it's great, mm -hmm. but isn't it more work for you in a 
sense because you're kind of having three or four different things going on at the same time. And wouldn't that be hard? Because if you have the really high kids or the ones that did everything they're supposed to do, you know, the ones that know how to play school well, mm -hmm. and then, like, they get past to where you plan for that day or whatever, what do you do in that kind of situation? Uh, right. Um, I've ran into that a few times. It, it is, it's a tremendous amount of work. This year I pretty much feel as busy as I did my first year teaching. And for really the way I want my classroom to run, it's a three-year progress. You know, you, you could almost spend a year just making all your lectures, getting all your content, thinking about this is the order, this is how I want to deliver things. This year, I barely have enough time just to make the videos. I mean, and it means a lot of, I get into school at like 6 a.m. and record a video before the kids come in and then edit it, put it on YouTube during my conference time, a lot of Saturday afternoons, a lot of all-day Sundays. So but then the next year, I can take the flipping, the videos I already have, and then really start to do, I mean, there's been some amazing things we've learned about that, I, that you sit there in the session and go, yeah, that'd be sweet, except I have no time to spend with this formative assessment and these interaction discussions. But through flipping and or social media, you now will have time for that stuff. And, and lest he, he and I scare you about this, there's flipping with Kirsch, uh, Mr. An Paul Anderson's videos. I When I was doing oh, introduction yeah, to in, intro flipping, awesome. I was amazing. using his. I, I don't even I don't like to hear myself talk, honestly, even though I sound like I'm talking a lot. <laughs> I, I'd rather hear Mr. Anderson do that and then go individually to the kids that aren't getting it and help them do a little more. And this wasn't more work for me, A, because I wasn't making my own videos, but B, I was just using the same labs, same activities, Supplementing with worksheets, all the stuff I was already doing, I just was doing it differently. So, so you basically come up with like the flow. This is the flow, and so they move along the flow as they right. As okay. they progress. Yeah, and right. there's what I want to move towards is a completely self-paced, mastery-based classroom, and that'll take so how, at least one to two more years. They they, they take quizzes. So then well, I, I would. Uh, we we have tons to show you, and I'll be happy to talk to you at the end. But what I want to suggest is a: you look at um, flip your classroom. The gentlemen who are the in the forefront at a Colorado that started this in their science classes. Pretty much invented. Yeah. Flip your classroom, um, and then I'll, I'll give you their names. I'll find them on my computer. I would also like you to to go to flipping with Kirch. Um, and I'll tell you her web address as well. She's amazing. She's a math teacher, but she realized that, you know, they're flowing and they're at different paces. And unfortunately, we're in school and it's timed. So everybody, you know, you can do it how you want to all along, but on this day, uh, everybody is taking the test. And I will help you get there and I'll help you practice and make sure you're ready on your journey, but we're done on this day. And that's how she dealt with that problem. I'll look, I promise I'll look we'll, it up we'll, for you. We'll, we'll, get put it, it up we'll get it out for you. Okay. The, and what I do with the kids who get too far, if they get ahead of me, then A, I need, I need to pick up my game. And, or B, I, I send them back. They, they then become the content expert. And they can talk student to student, kid to kid. And a lot of times when I explain, they're like, yeah, 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 but you said a lot of sciencey things. And so you have your top tier kids then can tutor in class and work with your uh, kids who are needing more help. So it's... Yeah, ne ne tell you what, next year I'm coming back, we'll do a whole flip. <laughs> we will. Yeah, it'll be good. Can we do it? <laughs> oh, it'll, it'll be awesome. Yeah, yeah, we will be and, and if you teach bio, use any of my videos that you want. YouTube.com slash SC Patterson MBHS. It's on the, I think it's on the handout. Can we get people to go to this website for us as well? <laughs> oh, we're we're going we're gonna to switch things so up. Crowded. We're going to show you another uh, way to use social media question and answer session. Okay, so we're doing. I I didn't. I hadn't tried pull everywhere because I was blocked. So my school, I was able to get to Socrative. So I was able to embed or put into PowerPoints different questions, um, so I could do formative assessment as I was talking to my students. And since we were allowed to initiate um, a little. Go ahead and try seeing how it works if you bring your if they bring their devices to school. Um, so this is kind of one of the initiatives that we've tried, and I find it very effective. It really keeps them on track. 
I'm going to have you do Poll Everywhere, and um, I'm going to ask you questions as we go through the rest of our presentation, and you might end up, like my kids, I'm going to release the questions on my time, because I want you to listen to this, and they get mad, they're like, release the next question, I know it's methylation, come on, and they're, but it's really engaging that way for them. So you want us on Poll Everywhere, or you want us on No, Socrat. 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 And what's really great about this is, uh, I had an organic chemistry professor in college who couldn't make it in that day, did Socratic from home, asking the students questions. They had class even though he couldn't make it in. You can, like, if you have a kid who's absent from school but doesn't want to fall behind with a back channel, with Socratic, that student is still partially there in your classroom. And if you have some kind of digital posting thing or a kid that can share notes, they can pretty much be there and not miss nearly as much as they would miss normally. So you have to come into my room. So can everybody see we're in room 791344? Oh, I thought we were. Did you go to Socrative and then log in? Yeah, you, you're, I'm sorry. You're supposed to I, I thought you said Polar. Polar. Oh, no. yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So, Socrative.com. Student login, join the room. Thank you, Buckeye Valley. 791-344. Now you're looking at my page here. The teacher page is different than the student page, and you can create your own quizzes. You can start one. I make them ahead of time, and then I'm ready to go when I do my notes. Okay, so I have created one. I just wanted to leave this up there for you to see the class number, my room number. Yes, now you're waiting for me. So pretty soon, and I'm sorry that the internet is a little slow here, pretty soon it's going to show me how many students are in my room. So I'm going to, I don't have anybody yet. <laughs> it's spinning. It's spinning, I know. We might get stuck, unfortunately. <laughs> it works fine, usually. So, you know, technology is as it is. I always find in these big... Okay, so we've been talking a lot about Twitter. I think most everybody is sort of familiar with this, right? And um, I'll have I'll turn this over to Scott when I'm ready to start loading this secretive thing back up. Um, but I did want to point out to you, or to mention to you, that what I have found uh, doing these tw tweets through the convention, not only are we getting recognized from people somewhere in the world, um, so, and they're retweeting, and they're commenting on stuff we're saying. Uh, additionally, I'm putting in there stuff that I just, you know, I held my, com my computer up, and I saw that QR code, it went right to my computer, and then I just copied the link and tweeted it. Now I can go back to the Twitter feed, and I don't have to write all that. I've got my notes written for me already. And, and little notes to self, you know. Hey, use uh, Paige Keeley's, um, I'm sorry, Formative assessment, whichever one I was looking at at the time, at the beginning of school to see what science, you know, have to see what kids think science is before we even start the school year. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and some of the other ways you can use it, if, if you're not a big chan fan of the back channel, um, you can use it, I'll skip PLM for a minute, you can use it for formative assessment for that exit slip. Hey, on the way to class, tweet me, you know, here's a question, tweet me the answer. And they can hit it while they're walking to the door. You don't necessarily even have to have a smartphone. Uh, I was just talking with uh, one of the young ladies. This, this is ancient. This is like 10 years old. No joke. It's, I can't believe it still even works. I have no data. I, you know, I just have texting. But you can link your Twitter account with text messages. And then it's going to be rare that you have a student on most levels that doesn't at least have something to send a crap ton of text to everyone they know. And then they can get text messages anytime they see a tweet. And they can send text messages. And that's actually when Twitter was invented, it was designed to be a texting to internet relay system. And so you don't have to have, it doesn't have to be really high tech, you don't have to have a bunch of kids with devices. Most of the stuff you can get to use in some way with existing technology that most people have access to. Uh, one of the other things, um, and this, this is where it's really been huge for me, having a, a professional learning network. Um, there's, there's all kinds of, if I have a question, I can tweet it out to my PLN and within minutes I will get good answers. Within hours I will get spectacular answers. And there's so much sharing that can occur between professionals, teacher to teacher, with people that you would never meet in person just because of geographic isolation. That you can now share and work with and collaborate on a way higher level than we could before. 
You should be getting a question from Socratic now. I had to read that. Oh, somebody just answered. <laughs> Yes. Absolutely. Um, I started asking parents to send in their old smartphones that they were no longer using, and you can connect to the Wi-Fi. So I have like six now, just just old phones. And I'm in their district, but I'm an elementary teacher. My, the elementary session was canceled, so oh, I'm here. Okay. Well, we're glad to be here. Okay. We are so glad to be here. <laughs> um, uh, one of the ones that I found um, when you search social media in the classroom, I thought this was cool. If they're tweeting back and forth, what if, what if they're role playing? You know, Rachel Carson versus the company of an, an oil company CEO. You know, something to think about. Okay, we got we're getting the, the kind of answers. Very cool. You're coming through. So, if you go to the next one, live oh, previous. Yes, I can. I can show it live. I can have Socrative the up there so they can see. And she and uh, Elizabeth and I were talking earlier. I could have my lecture on one side and the Socrative answers coming on. You, you can minimize the window because it's on the internet. And you could, they could see my lecture plus what they're saying and how they're answering. We can do it that way as well. Um, we're, oh, I'm sorry. For Twitter, the next one. Oh, where's mine? Okay. Oh, never mind. Okay. Okay. So, um, I'm a biology teacher, and I stole a question or a, an activity from another AP Bio teacher that I thought was amazing. So he had kids learning about organelles, cell parts, and then they had to focus on one of their organelles to become experts in it. Perfectly fine. But the bump up in the technology thing he did is he made them come up with Twitter accounts for their organelle, and they had to try to convince their audience that their organelle was the best, the, the most important to the cell. It's called Organelle Wars, and it's perfect. I I've, I've put some of the tweets come, some of my kids put up here that I thought were pretty effective. Um, at both, nu both Nucleus said, since you're so essential to life, why can cells still live without you, Golgi Body? So they're t tweeting back to the Golgi Body. Or Team Golgi is writing to the endoplasmic reticulum, since you can transport proteins throughout the cell. Oh, just kidding, you can't. <laughs> Who modifies proteins? We do. I mean, they're, they're like that constantly, and it was, it was pretty slick. Uh, I knew they knew what they were doing. Though mitochondria says, um, vote for us because everyone likes the life of the party, okay? Because they provide energy. And then the chloroplast, right? But perhaps, but we put the party in the cake. We put the sugar in the cake. Party, anyone? So they're back and forth like this. And that's fun. And I'm excited. And my husband, yeah, they call themselves chloroplast. My husband's like, it's 10 o'clock at night, you're getting another of those tweets from the, the <laughs> nucleus now. And if you click the next and, and, and just to cut in for a second, it takes advantage of the fact that kids want to, on some level, they want to trash talk each other. Yes. And this gives them a safe place to do it. And also, they're learning, they're able to show their knowledge. I mean, this is accessible data. You can see who knows what about which organelles. Where are my gaps in knowledge? What remediation do I have to now address in class? And when somebody tweeted something that was not scientifically accurate, you don't think those tweets didn't come back that said, oh no, um, check your facts there, Nucleus. I mean, they went back and forth like that. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because with the right hashtag, your students' tweets can be seen across the world. So at 10 o'clock at night, there's tweeting coming in because it sounds like a little bird when it chirps on there. And I get this one and it's, what, this lady with this green glasses and it says Golgi is the best? I'm like, okay, not cool. So I'm talking to my kids and they're not in my class. And I'm to his room and the next day, like, how do I find out who's this woman? She is a professor of plant biology in Oxford, England, studying the Golgi body. And she wanted to support my kids that they're right, the Golgi's the best. But the best part about this is she threw a question out there. And we interacted and she interacted with us. And it was amazing. But she asked a question. And one of my seniors came to me and said, well, I read four scientific articles last night. I'm not sure I totally understood them, but I didn't want to look stupid when I tweeted the answer back to her. I'm like, what? Oh, okay, that's too bad. I'm like, oh, my gosh. All right, so then that leads to Skyping. My husband's always thinking of things for me to do. So why don't you ask her, will she video conference with your kids? She's already talking to you. And she did. So video conferencing, it's a free call. Um, it takes some of your, the, the computer memory. So you probably should let your tech people know you're going to do it. 
But my kids prepared their questions ahead of time. They wrote them out. I okayed them before <laughs> they were allowed to ask them. But they weren't asking things. One little girl said, since you're in England, are you drinking tea all the time? I mean, that was her, the question she wanted to know. But most of them prepared ahead of time and really wanted to look smart in front of this college professor. And so here we are. This is uh, Dr. Osterreiter and her assistant. My kids learned why she decided to study the Golgi body, because they paid for her to go to school. Full PhD, why not? I, I, I can do this. And what she was doing. And she's dragging the Golgi body around the cell away from the endoplasmic reticulum to see if she can separate them. And she's got video of it doing. And then she set that to music. I mean, she's doing social media to reach kids about her work. And the most striking thing that they came away with after this call was they made her rewrite her paper over and over again. Is that because she's a girl? Is it no, it's because she's a scientist and you have to rewrite and resubmit so that it's perfected and that's why you rewrite lab reports. That's why you do it this way. Yeah, it's like Dinah said yesterday, eat, sleep, excrete, run. Right. So by tweeting, you can get a hold of people that you would never be able to have your kids talk to. So for example, uh, I don't know if you know Ohio State football at all. There's a gentleman on special teams named Craig Feda. He's a walk-on. Uh, they had a lovely article about him in the Columbus Dispatch. My husband's reading it. He said, this kid is, is working hard. He wants to go to med school. He's a smart kid. He, you know, he's, he's doing everything right and playing football. So why don't you, why don't you talk to him? I'm like, okay, one more thing to do. So get online and Google. And they're not going to give you these kids' emails addresses at all. I couldn't uh, find that, but I did find his Twitter <laughs> handle. And I said, hey, Craig Feta, how about you video conference my ninth graders and tell them what it takes to get to college, what kind of time involvement is it if you're, if you're playing football and trying to keep your grades up. And he went, okay. And it was just 10 minutes of their time, but they were thrilled. I, we talked to an Ohio State football player. Mainly, if you take nothing else away from this, the reason you should be using social media in your classroom is it opens up your students for that authentic audience and so many more opportunities than just I would be able to provide my kids. I mean, there's this infinite amount of possibilities that we can use if we hijack a place that kids are already going to learn all kinds of things we may or may not want them to know. Why don't we have them, while they're there, learn some science in the meantime? Absolutely. So this next thing you have probably seen before, it's called a meme. It's pronounced like meme gene. Okay, so um, so it's, it's a thought. It's like a pun to me. It's like a pun or just a, a thought captioned in, in just a little picture. So I thought, you know, why not have them create science puns? Then I'll see, do they really get this material if they can push it to a pun? Um, and help them practice the higher order thinking skills. Okay, so we have some examples for you. This one's from Dr. Osterreiter. She tweeted this out to our class. So if humans had cell walls, would we be invincible or just rigid? And then I like this one. Seriously, dude, you're overreacting. So, so it's a thought captured in a little cartoon. There's some green Big Bang ones. Oh, absolutely. They're everywhere. But how do the kids make them? Yeah, you can use those websites like ImageFlip, and huh? you can have kids make their own and use it as a formative assessment, use it as a way to share their knowledge. You can have your upper level kids through social media teaching your lower level kids in different classes. I've had my college prep biology students make content that I use to instruct my at-risk life science kids. And it's more relevant to them because it's coming from students, from people that they appreciate more. You ready? <laughs> I turn my telescope in the air sometimes, singing air. <laughs> called for a fog delay. Our department chair called me just as I reached the bottom of the biggest <laughs> hill. Oh, and I was halfway. Nice. I was like, nope, nope, not going back. Just okay. Two, two hours. This one, uh, this one I like. It talks about the back channel. There, there really is, if, if we get enough people in a Twitter back channel, there's an entire separate conference happening. Two conferences all at one time. If you remember the show Pin My Ride, this was sort of like, oh, we heard that you were really into puppies, so we put puppies on top of puppies with other puppies inside your car, which now looks like a puppy. And when you toot the horn, it's a puppy barking dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a meme. 
the, the big closing thought here, I mean, I'm a little younger. This is sort of in my wheelhouse. I've always been really interested in technology and techie type things. Haven't always had the budget to finance all my techie type things, but I make it happen anyway. But, you know, Bonnie, she's, she's a digital immigrant. She didn't come into this. And she, I mean, she jumped in with even less time than I did. I took a lot of time to figure out Twitter and I, like, talked to my kids about it. Like, I had one girl stand up and shout, you stay off of Twitter, Mr. Patterson. That is for us. Yeah. I have to interrupt. I'm sorry. Um, maybe five years ago? Yes. I turned 45 and my husband bought me a Kindle and I cried because all the books we're going away forever. I'll never be able to feel them or smell them. And he sent it back and sent me this email. I sent the Kindle back. Someday you will come to the 21st century. And so, <laughs> so it's taken a little while, and he was right. I'm, and, and I'm here. And the big thought, I mean, for me, I was very comfortable. Bonnie was not comfortable. I, I really want to put out to you guys that you shouldn't be comfortable. If you are comfortable, you're probably stagnant. Really, really. At no point in my teaching career, this is my sixth year, have I not been working my tail off and felt like, oh, there's so, all the things must be done and they must all be done all the time. And, and I love that. And, and just the idea that don't be afraid of failing with this. Don't be afraid of technology not working and the Wi-Fi is really crappy and you have a day where you have to punt. I mean, literally, these are experiences that your children, your students need to see. If your kids never see you fail in the classroom, how will they ever know that it's okay for them to fail the first, second, fifth, tenth time that they try something? How can we teach them tenacity if we aren't willing to be tenacious ourselves?